That was wonderful. Thank you. Peace be with you all. Welcome to this time and place, this place of worship where we deal with fun microphone issues. Wow. Thought I had it figured out. Still working on it. Glad to see you all this morning. Welcome to this time of worship. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, we are glad to have you together here from First Congregational United Church of Christ. Can you smell the chili? It's pretty good. Today is Chili Cook-Off Sunday. Uh, there are a bunch of chilies that are staying warm on the other side of the building. Uh, if you are here, hopefully you bought tickets. If you didn't, that's okay. I will give you some directions in a moment. A couple of announcements to share with you first. You may have seen in your bulletins a poinsettia order form. Uh, we are again having uh, poinsettias for our Christmas Eve service, but we need to get the orders in by next Sunday. So if you'd like to order one, please fill that out and leave it in the offering plate or get it into the church office by next Sunday. If you're online, you can do it online, I'm sure, and, or contact the church office this week and, and Barb will help you out. We are doing a styrofoam collection today, styrofoam and food collection today from 11 to 1 and tomorrow from 1 to 4 p.m. There are more details in your bulletin about that, about with a list of the kinds of food that's needed and all of that. So please check out your bulletin for that. That's today and tomorrow for styrofoam and food. Uh, also, just kind of a general announcement, we have a variety of events that are resuming now. Some of them are in person, some are still virtual. So as you see something in the church calendar that you're curious about, you can watch our newsletter or you can contact the church office if you want information on how to get connected with one of those events. The newsletter comes out electronically midweek, usually Tuesday, depending on how quick I am in getting my lead article written. Usually, uh, but it comes out midweek. If you don't get that, that means we don't have you on our mailing list. So you can also contact the church office to make sure you are um, on uh, that. Uh, another announcement, you may or may not remember, a couple of years ago during our annual meeting, we passed a resolution to form a partnership with a church in Angola. That then kind of went on hiatus a little bit as that church went through some transition and then we had COVID and a bunch of other stuff, but we're now getting that back up and running again. So we're going to be hearing more information about that over the next couple of months, particularly at the town meeting in January. But the reason I'm mentioning it is we actually are having a, a guest preacher from Angola in two weeks. Uh, he's not connected with that specific congregation, but Reverend Moma is going to be here. He's in the United States doing a, a doctoral program in Chicago, and we get to welcome him as a guest preacher. So I just want to mention that, uh, that to make sure you have that on your calendars. That's two weeks from today, uh, November 28th. Okay, now chili cook-off. Uh, I'm told to please ask you to enter the community room through the door on this side. If you've already paid, you should be good. They have that listed. If you haven't yet, they'd be delighted to take your money today. You can also do it electronically on your phone. Just go to our website, loveandjustice.org slash donate, and then you can select uh, Chili Cook-Off from the drop-down menu and show them that you paid on your phone. If you did not bring containers with you to take the chili with you, they have containers available, and they're asking, however, for a $2 donation to cover the cost of those containers. I think I got it. Let us now come into this moment thinking, getting our focus into this moment, into the presence of God in this space, in our lives, and let us begin our morning worship.
Please rise in body or spirit and join in the call to worship. Blessed be the name of God from this time on and forevermore. In the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of God is to be praised. It is good to give thanks to God, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. We remain standing for the opening hymn, Let Justice Flow Like Streams, which is printed in your bulletin. Let us join together in the prayer of invocation. Spirit of love and truth, guide us as we pray to think and wish and praise in a spirit of gratitude with heartfelt sentiment. Quiet our minds and slow our anxious hearts that we may feel your presence and raise prayers of sincerity and courage in the spirit of Christ we pray, amen. Now, please turn and greet those around you with a safe sign of peace or an elbow bump. And the children can come forward, take a seat on one of these brightly colored circles and join Mrs. Southwood. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good. Good. All right. So um, in today's reading, we're going to learn about Amos. And Amos was a prophet of God um, who works to remind people to trust in God and to treat one another with justice and fairness. Can you think of, and to also help serve others when they're in need. Can you think of some ways that we can help others or that you already do? Yeah, holding the door open, that's a good manner. Yeah, Matilda. Um, like, when we're out of place, like, when there's community service, or dinner, or something? Absolutely, community service, animal shelter, food pantry, food kitchen, absolutely. Hannah. That's really nice, so then it didn't hit the person behind you? was really good. Katie? Oh, help others grow plants? I could use your help. My plants do not do so well by myself. So yeah, planting, planting plants or trees. Speaking of that, what is something else that we could help? It's not a person, but it's something that is really important that needs our help. COVID shot? Yep, absolutely. What's something else that needs our help? You're right on it. What's the big thing we live on that involves nature and the environment? Trees. Trees, yeah. And all of those things live on what? Earth. Earth. Has anybody read the story by Dr. Seuss called The Lorax? Yeah. Yes. Well, I watched the movie. I read that. 
So has anyone seen this one? It's the Lorax telling us how to help the Earth. No, I have not. All right. So it, we have some good ideas hopefully in here. So we're going to read it together for a few minutes, okay? I know it's smaller pictures, but let's see. All right. Hello, I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees and the fish and the birds, and I'm asking you, please, to help out the Earth. I am counting on you. Together, I know there's a lot we can do. First, I have a question, and I need to ask it. Do you know where the trash goes that's in your waste basket? Where does the trash go? A dump? It's garbage can? A dump? Where do you think, Ev? In, in the garbage can. That's right. All those answers are right. It goes out to the curb, then a dump truck comes by, heaped with big piles of trash that are smelly and high. Some days after that, these big piles of trash will be buried or dumped in a giant landfill. Some of the garbage that's dumped there will rot, but most of the garbage that's dumped there will not. Some, <clears throat> some cities burn trash, but this trash solution creates lots of smoke, which creates air pollution. The good news? Things don't have to go on this way. We can reduce trash, and we can start right away. How do you think we can reduce trash? Yes. Yeah. Uh, throw away trash. Throw it away. That's how do we Reusable? Same thing, that's Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All those are great ideas. Take your lunch in a bag, but don't throw it away. Use the bag or a lunchbox again the next day. How many of you have a reusable lunchbox that you use? Awesome. Yeah, I see even adults raising their hand. Me too. Use both sides of your paper, and I have no doubt there will be much less waste for you to throw out. Normally, when I prepare for children's time, I feel better having paper just in case my brain forgets. I still figured I couldn't do that today with talking about green, so that's why I have my phone up here. <laughs> when you've read magazines and you no longer need them, pass them to your friends so they'll get to read them. Does anybody do that anymore? Mm. Something? Yeah. What do you think about like going to the library, getting borrowing books instead of buying them? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, if you have a favorite, then you think you could. So you can always try it out from the library. And if you like it, then you can always buy it, right? Rather than tossing your old clothes, toys, and shoes, donate to them. They're things other people can use. Who's ever donated old clothes or shoes or toys, right? Doesn't that feel good when you can help others? Yeah. Put used soda cans in a recycling bin, rinse them out when they're empty, and throw them right in. They'll be made into new cans. This can I have here is made from old cans I recycled last year. How many of you have a big, um, in this blue can that you put recycling in at when it's garbage day? Yeah, that's right. Paper clips, rubber bands, buttons, and screws are things you will find that are easy to reuse. Put these things in a drawer so they're all in one place. They'll be easy to find and won't take up much space. Does anybody ever use leftover rubber bands or paper clips? Or I use clothespins for chip clips. It's amazing. Yeah. Good job, guys. When dead batteries are dumped, this fact I have found, the chemicals in them leak into the ground. Use rechargeable batteries, charge them, and then when they run out of power, just charge them again. Anybody ever used rechargeables? Yeah. That's something I'm going to work on because we have a lot of battery stuff at our house, but I think I'm going to try to get rechargeables from now on. In helping the earth, you can take it from me. We need to find ways to use less energy. Energy power cars, it creates heat and light made from gas, coal, and oil we burn day and night. These are natural resources, and there is a limit to how much of them our whole world has within it. We need to use less, and I just have to say there are ways to use less energy every day. How about this? When you leave a room, do you stop and turn off the light? Mm -hmm. well, sometimes we forget, but if we keep trying to remember, right, the hope is that we'll do it more. How about turning off your computer at night or your no. phone or tablet? Right? We should start turning it off. I close mine too. I should turn it off. I do that. You do. Grady does a great job. He reminds us to turn it off at home. I do it. You do it too. 
When it's cold, wear a sweatshirt and take the time, please, to turn down the heat just a couple of degrees. Make sure you talk to your parents about that one. Don't, don't take it on your own. When you're doing your homework or starting to read, sunlight through a window may be all that you need. Do you ever think that? Open the curtain and then you don't even have to turn a light on? You close the curtain, turn the light on, yeah. open them, turn the light off. And turn the light off, very good. And then you're right, because it's getting darker now. But when you can use the sun, right? Animals and plants, all things alive, need to have water. It's how we survive. So water is something we need to save too. There are ways we can save it. I'll show you a few. When you get up each morning and stand at the sink and start brushing your teeth, do you leave the water on or turn it off? Turn it off. Turn it off. Off. Awesome. That's one good way to help save water. Hey, hey, Mama, yeah. if you turn it off, if you forget to leave it on, then it will, the water will get everywhere. It'll get everywhere, and then we're not, we're not saving the water, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Spend less time in the shower, and you'll still get clean. How about a four-minute shower? Do you think you can take that challenge and get done in four minutes? Yeah. Two? Uh, doesn't have, like, a minute here. In a minute? I, I think that's a good challenge, as long as you're still using soap and scrubbing, right? <laughs> to help out the earth, please do something for me. Find a place that's near you, and then, hey, Katie, go plant a tree. Lawrence was thinking just like you. Trees provide shelter and oxygen, too, so plant lots of trees. It's what I always do. If we work together, the earth will get better, the land will be cleaner, the soil will be wetter. The sun will shine brighter, the trees will be greener, the sky will be bluer, the air will be cleaner. And next time I speak for the trees, fish, and birds, I know in my heart I'll need only two words. Mama. One sec. For all that you've done and for all that you will do, I'm the Lorix, and I say a great big. Mama. Thank you. Will you say a prayer with me? Yeah. Dear Lord, please help us to follow your path and your message, and your message to, be to be kind to others and help others in need, help others in need. including our one and only yeah. earth. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys and girls. You can go to children's time. And the middle schoolers, junior hires can go too. As we enter into this time of joyful giving, we recall how each of us is beloved by God and how important it is to love one another because love is from God. Love reminds us to be humble and generous as we remember how truly interdependent we are. In this time of offering, we thank you for contributing to the Ministry of Justice and Love at First Congregational United Church of Christ. You can send in contributions through the mail, through your financial institutions, banking system, or by going to www.loveandjustice.org slash donate. We are ever grateful for your support at this time. May God bless this offering of love and use it to increase love's presence in the world. Before going into our time of prayer, I want to share a couple of notes with you. The choir anthem has a verse that the congregation is invited to sing along with. It's in bold in your bulletin. It's just on the next page over. So just watch Christopher and he'll, he will tell you when to come in. 
Also, our final hymn this morning, the choir is singing the verses and the congregation is singing the chorus. Uh, So just again, watch for those things. Now in this time of prayer, this time we lift our concerns and joys into the attention of God. Uh, We wanna pray for Alexis, who's struggling with COVID. We wanna pray for other family members in the hospital for various issues. There are others recovering from illness. We wanna keep them all in our prayers today. Let us begin this time of prayer, beginning with a moment of quiet. Holy, mighty, mysterious, and creative God. Over the past couple of days, the first snowflakes of the season have found their way to the earth from the heavens. And so we are reminded of the cyclical aspects of nature that the world around us, the earth itself, experiences seasons of change. Temperatures change. The length of the day changes. Things die. And then things come back to life in the spring. These cycles remind us, O God, of your continuing presence through hard times and good times, through times of sorrow, times of darkness, and times of joy and light. We pray for faithfulness, O God, through shorter days and colder temperatures. And we pray for this time to be restorative, regenerative. As the roots of trees who've lost their leaves dig further into the soil to rest in a time of dormancy. So may we use this time to rest, to tend to our inner selves as we prepare for our own times of growth and rebirth around the corner. Oh God, for particular concerns, we pray this morning, whatever it is that's troubling our minds or stirring our hearts today, we thank you for hearing it. Whether our bodies or minds are needing your healing touch, we pray, O oh God, for that to occur. And we thank you, dear one, for community, for friends, for family, for times in which we experience closeness and support as we go through difficult times. We thank you for times of sharing food, even if we're doing it as takeout. We thank you for the joy that these days give us. May we all in this season of thanksgiving recall for ourselves and to you all for which we are grateful. We pray to you, God, because you came to us in Christ. And so it is that we say together in his spirit, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's reading is from Amos, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and 21 through 24. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uziah of Judea and the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of Carmel dries up. Seek good and not evil that you may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Just as you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be, just, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Here ends the reading. Would you please join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Seek good and not evil, says the prophet, that you may live. And so the Lord will be with you. Hate evil and love good and establish justice. Seems like straightforward enough advice on ethics from the prophet coming from the 8th century before the Common Era. When it comes to ethics, evaluating how we make decisions, determining the goodness or rightness of our decisions. We sometimes confuse the choice between good and evil or right and wrong with whether or not something is within or against the rules. We think we're complimenting someone when we say, that person plays by the rules. But there is sometimes a difference between following the rules and doing good. Now, I realize also the overly simplistic binary of good and evil is not without problems. There's some real estate, some gray area, between those two. We can probably think of examples about which it's not so easy to determine whether something is good or evil. Context can radically change a situation such that the same action may be good in one context and bad in another. We need rules, of course. We need laws. But is legality the only thing that matters when we're judging a given action? Do we assume that legal equals good, illegal equals, well, if not evil, at least wrong, if not bad? Take, for instance, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. He killed two people and wounded one. No one is disputing that. I hope most of us would consider those actions bad, maybe even evil. But was what he did illegal? 
Some are saying his actions are okay because he was defending himself and defending businesses from looters. At least that's what he says. Others consider the totality of the circumstances. Maybe even backing up from the moment of the actions themselves. Is it appropriate, for example, for anyone, let alone a 17-year-old kid, to take an assault rifle into such a situation? The circumstances of this case push us into areas in which the law may not be adequate to determine whether or not what happened was a right or wrong action. Remember, our legal system, in our legal system, a conviction or acquittal is a judgment about the trial, whether or not there was enough evidence to convict. It does not determine actual guilt or innocence and definitely doesn't determine good or bad, right or wrong. And if you think I'm psyching myself up for a result in this trial that I'm not gonna like, you're correct. In the United States, Christians have often conflated that which is legal for that which is moral. You might hear it in the Rittenhouse case, Christians arguing that this young man is okay because his actions were committed in self-defense. Laws are written to protect a person's right to defend themselves in some circumstances. Again, I digress. Another example where the law may not be the best tool for determining good and evil is our immigration laws. Migration has always been a part of the human experience since the beginning of humanity. Maybe people moved when the weather changed seasonally, people moved to find food or water, people moved to find work. Throughout the Bible, there are multiple repeated admonitions to welcome the stranger, to treat the stranger as a citizen, as an explicit acknowledgement that migration is an expected human behavior. I know there are differing opinions on this, but let's think for a minute about that assumption that legal equals right or good and illegal equals wrong or bad. If the law is so important, so significant in determining right and wrong, we need to figure out where these laws come from. Who wrote them? Who had a seat at the table when those laws were decided? What considerations were a part of the creation of those laws? Laws are not always a matter of justice or ethics. They're more often a reflection of who has the power and who does not because not everyone is in, to coin a phrase, the room where it happened. Which is why I think Amos does not say seek the legal and not illegal. He says, seek good, that you may live. Note, he's telling people to seek good in order to live, not so that you may go to heaven when you die. He says, so you may live, and the Lord God of hosts will be with you. Seek good, love the good, that you may live, and God will be with you. All right, according to Amos then, what is good? How do we seek good? If it's not about the law or the rules, how do we know what good is? In the beginning of the book, the prophet lists off a series of transgressions perpetrated by various nations. He mentions Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, the Ammonites, Moab, and he names the sins of these groups, these communities, attacking their neighbors, exiling conquered people, betrayal, violently going after Judah, attacking pregnant women, burning a king. Amos doesn't like the violence with which these countries are treating each other. You can imagine as the 
ancient folks were listening in on this list, these would have been Hebrews hearing one after another of their neighbors con getting condemned by the prophet. You can imagine them thinking, yeah, go get him, Amos. But Amos doesn't stop at the borders of Israel. He includes the kingdoms of Judah and Israel in his attack. He accuses Judah of rejecting the law of God. And of Israel, he says, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. In other words, they had abandoned God, disrespected righteous people, and they only cared about what was in it for themselves. The book of Amos gets fairly pointed. His critique is blistering as he condemns various people for various sins. There are some things he says directly, but to fully determine what Amos thinks is good, we sometimes have to look at what he says is evil and think backwards. Doing that, we can see he obviously believes in faithfulness. Faithfulness to God's covenant wouldn't be important to him, and, or if it weren't important to him, he wouldn't have criticized Judah for rejecting God's law and statutes. He also clearly believes in justice, specifically economic justice. In chapter 5, in the verses right before the instruction to seek good and not evil, Amos attacks those who trample the poor and take from them levies of grain. In other words, he's saying explicitly an unjust tax system mistreats the poor. He's critiquing a systemic problem, a political problem specifically. And this is a point I want to hang out on for a minute. The law says that the poor must pay this tax, this levy of grain. So if we're defining right and wrong by legal and illegal, you must conclude that this tax is right. It's a good thing. But Amos says no. To take from the poor and powerless for the benefit of the rich and powerful is an abuse of power. It's one way the nation is trampling the poor. Amos wants us to seek good and love good. Good is a bigger concept than whether or not something is legal. Law is a matter of power. Who has the power to make and enforce laws? Sometimes people who have those powers exercise that power fairly. Sometimes laws are written well and enforced in ways that are very much just. Our Constitution is a work in progress in terms of providing justice to everyone fairly. It started out as a document protecting only white landowning men over the age of 21. And we've had to amend it several times in order to expand its protections to other people. But we're doing that. We've shown how power can be exercised in ways that are good and just. But this doesn't mean that simply because a law is the law, that it's necessarily inherently good. The last good I want to point out from Amos is nonviolence. And this one gets kind of overlooked a little bit with Amos. Amos is frequently mentioned in economic justice conversations, rightly so, but his language and tone is, while his language and tone is aggressive, he's clearly not okay with the violent ways with which these nations have been interacting with each other. He condemns their warfare multiple times. He even questions the exceptionalism of Judah and Israel, which is rather remarkable. In chapter 8, God, through Amos, asks the Israelites, Are you not like the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel? says the Lord. Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Arameans from Kerr? In other words, don't think you're so special. God liberated you, yes, but God also liberated other people. The, co 
covenant between Israel and God is not an excuse to dehumanize or dismiss other nations and peoples. So if we are to create an ethic from this ancient prophet, it ultimately centers around the just exercise of power. Is the exercise of power done in a way that is, first of all, faithful to God? Is a nation, is a society faithful to the God who liberates the captive, who cares deeply for the poor and vulnerable, and who cares about all nations? How does a community or a nation interact with its neighbors? Are they fair? Are they respectful? Do they treat each other as family? And importantly, internal policies matter too. In particular, the treatment of the poor. Do the poor have enough to eat? Do they have enough to provide for their families? Are the laws, including tax laws, making their lives harder or better? Is the system taking advantage? Amos wants Israel and Judah to be faithful to God, to exercise power with respect for their neighbors outside their border, and he wants them to establish justice for the poor within their border as well. Seek the good, love the good, and hate evil. Using words like good and evil may feel like strong language, We may not like the simplistic binary of good and evil, but maybe the strength of this language helps us to better understand the stakes of what Amos is discussing. The just exercise of power, treatment of our neighbors, and compassion for the vulnerable. Not everybody likes it when preachers quote unquote get political. But the Bible doesn't shy away from describing injustice in the political systems of its day. Specifically, prophets like Amos note very clearly when economic and legal systems stack the deck against the poor and vulnerable. So it's not just permissible for preachers. I'd argue it's incumbent on all of us, all followers of God, all Christians, to push policymakers to do better to look out for people who need help, to use their power with compassion that justice may be established. We're all aware of specific policies under recent debate. I'm not going into details, and we don't have an election coming soon, but I would encourage you to take these ancient prophets seriously. Times may be different in many ways, but ethics, examining decisions and policies to determine good and evil, right and wrong, rather than whether or not something is merely legal or illegal, this is a divine calling. For all people of faith, we have a sacred obligation to ensure that power is exercised with justice. Thanks be to God, and amen. Choir is going to come up and sing the verses, and the the, the final hymns printed. The words are printed in the bulletin, and sing along as much as you care to.
dream of a world where there's justice and where everyone is free to build and grow and love and to simply have enough. The world will change when we dream God's dream. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. And the people said,